John chapter 21, starting in verse 15, God's word reads, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is President Harry S. Truman. About 20 years after Truman passed away, the Truman Library in Missouri found and made public 1,300 letters that Truman had written to his wife, Elizabeth. It turns out that Truman had a custom, something he always did no matter what. Whenever he was away on business, or whenever his wife, Elizabeth, had gone to visit family every day, every day of their marriage that they were apart, he wrote her a letter. It did not matter if he was dealing with the world's most powerful people. It did not matter if he was on the other side of the world or just a day trip away. For 53 years of marriage... Whenever they were apart, he wrote. He made sure that his wife Elizabeth knew that she was a high priority in his mind and heart. That he loved her. Now like Truman prioritized his wife in that way, like he loved his wife In that way, what are the people of God called to do? They are called to prioritize God above all else. To love him all the time. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. Later in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, it says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God. And that call to love God is reiterated and demonstrated constantly in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 When asked what is the greatest commandment, what is the greatest priority of man, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. To put it another way, 1 Corinthians 16.22 says, If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed, anathema, damned. Which leads us to a question. In the Old 
Testament and in the New Testament, the priority of God's people above all else is to love God. And that leads to a question, how are God's people supposed to love God? Well, Jesus answered that question multiple times. In John chapter 14, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He said after that in John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. If anyone, John 14, 23, again, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then later in 1 John 5, 3, it says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And then it says in 2 John Chapter or verse 6, and this is love. What is it? That we walk according to his commandments. Listen, when a person repents, that means turns from their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What happens. They are saved. They are redeemed. They're completely justified. All of their sin is forgiven. And then they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to start doing what? To start loving God by obeying his word. By doing what he calls us to do. How do we love God? We love God with obedience. We love God by Singing God's praises like he's commanded us to. We love God by humbly praying to God like he's commanded us to. We love God by reading his word like he's commanded us to. We love God by witnessing of the gospel of God like he's commanded us to. We love God by forgiving one another like he's commanded us to. When a person repents and puts all their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they are forgiven, they are cleansed, they become a child of God, and they are enabled by God finally to do something they couldn't do before, to love God in a way that's pleasing to Him. And how does a child of God, after salvation, love God? It's by doing what He says. It's by living according to his word. Now with all that swirling in our mind, with all of that, think about this. In Matthew 10, 32 to 33, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. So if a person is genuinely a child of God, they've repented and trusted in Jesus Christ, and as a result of their salvation are seeking to love God, what are they going to do? They're going to confess God before men. They're going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're going to stand unashamedly. They're going to stand boldly for Christ. Now with that in mind, do you guys remember what Peter said to Jesus the night before his crucifixion? In Matthew 26, 33, Peter said to Jesus, even though all may fall away, I will never fall away. Then two verses later, he's recorded saying, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will not deny you. That's Peter saying, I love you, Jesus. And like you said, a person who loves you will confess you before men. I will confess you before men, even if it costs me my life. I love you, Jesus. I will do what you say. But you all know what Peter did. Just a few hours later, a few hours after he said that, he failed to love Jesus. 
Three times he denied Jesus before. And Matthew records Peter cursing and swearing and taking an oath before men that he did not know, even know who Jesus was. Peter was a child of God who longed to love God by subsequently obeying his commands to the end. But he failed, failed, and failed again. And every believer in this room and around the globe can relate to Peter. Can I get an amen? Every single one of us can relate to what he did and what he was experiencing. Today, if you're a genuine believer in Jesus, you have a longing in your heart put there by the Holy Spirit to love God, to live according to his word no matter what. But like Peter, even after salvation, you and I long to love, we long to love, we try to love, but we fail, 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 fail. Amen? And that failure, you know, is crushing It is absolutely crushing. That's why the text says of Peter after his failure that he wept bitterly. And if you're a child of God, like Peter is a child of God, when you sin and you don't love God as he's called you to love him, it just crushes your heart. It just destroys your joy. But today in God's word, we're going to see something so beautiful, so beautiful encouraging we're going to see that yes the believer fails to love God yes the believer sinfully disobeys but upon that failure and upon that disobedience that failure to love it's not over that we have a God of amazing grace and tremendous power who's able to take us in our failure and restore us, lift us up and call us to love him all the more. That's what we're going to see in this passage. In this passage, there's two sections. The first section is three gracious calls for Peter to love God. The next section is the gracious promise that Peter would love God. It's going to happen. Let's look at the first, the first, the first, the three gracious calls for Peter to love God. Look at verse 15 in John 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Notice several key points there. First, notice the phrase, more than these. Most likely, that's a reference to the fishing boat, the equipment, the massive catch of fish that they just caught due to divine miracle and the fish that they're eating. As we discussed last week, Jesus told his disciples that upon his death, that every single one of them would, quote, return to his own as in go back to what he was, go back to what they were formerly doing. And that's what they did. They go back to their own. They're called to be fishers of men, but they go back to being fishers of fish. And we saw in the previous passage how Jesus got the disciples' attention with the divine miracle. They've been fishing all night. They don't catch anything. Jesus appears on shore and says, throw your net on the other side, and bam, Jesus is God, and he's screaming to his disciples, here I am, they get excited, they finally recognize Jesus, and they come to the shore. And Jesus eventually asks Peter, do you love me more than these? Next notice, the response of Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now at that moment, Jesus could have said, you lying scumbag. He could have said, you denied me three times. And upon my resurrection, you're back to being a fisher of fish instead of the fisher of men I've called you to. What are you talking about? You love me. 
But wow, praise Jesus for his amazing patience and grace. Amen? Jesus being God in the flesh obviously knows Peter's heart. He knows that, that Peter was sorry for his sin, hated his sin, and no, one, no longer wanted to live in sin, that his heart's full of genuine repentance, and he's longing to love Jesus, and in light of that, what does Jesus give him? He gives him amazing grace. He not only forgives, but he gives Peter a command. In other words, he gives Peter an opportunity to love him by obeying him. Let's look at the command. He says, feed my lambs. Well, in Psalm 95, verse 7, it says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, it is, excuse me, yeah, yeah, I got that right. Matthew 4, 4, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God that comes out of the mouth, mouth of God. What is going on here? What is this feed my lambs? Jesus is speaking metaphorically as he does in Psalm 95 and in, it's actually John chapter 10. He's making it clear that he's the good shepherd and the sheep are the people who believe in him, trust in him for salvation. And what does Jesus mean when he says feed my lambs? Well, like I just read in Matthew 4.4, 4, he's not talking about physical bread to eat. He's talking about spiritual food. He's talking about the word of God. Like 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says, like newborn infants desire the pill milk of the word, speaking of the words of God, so that you may grow up into your salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is Good. When Jesus calls Peter to feed his lambs, he's calling Peter to feed the people of God, the word of God, to teach and to preach. As Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, preach the word, feed the people of God. And that, that, is, that is nothing short of astounding. Nothing short of astounding. Peter deserved nothing but the harshest condemnation for his sin. But Jesus gave him grace. Not only is he forgiven, but he's called. He's given the opportunity to obey. He's given the opportunity to love God. Look at the next gracious call. Look at verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus asked the same question, what's your priority? What's the desire of your heart? Do you love me? Peter's response is the same. And Jesus gives the same command, slightly different. Previously it says, feed my sheep. Here it says, Tend, or your text may say, shepherd my sheep. To shepherd means to care for, it means to nourish, it means to guide. And like feeding the sheep of God, shepherding the people of God, what's the key ingredient to shepherding the people of God? Well, it's knowing the word of God, loving the word of God, living according to the word of God, and communicating the word of God. That's how you feed the flock of God, and that's how you shepherd. That's the primary tool. It's the Word of God. This is why elders, who are also called shepherds in the New Testament, this is why one of their requirements is that they must hold firm to the trustworthy Word as taught so that he must may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. So what does it mean to shepherd the flock of God? Well, you have to know the word of God. You have to believe the word of God. You have to love the word of God. And you have to communicate the word of God. Because through the word of God, you are going to give instruction and sound doctrine. And through the word of God, we're going to put aside unrighteousness. And we're going to put off false teaching. And we're going to adopt the righteousness of Christ as communicated through the Holy Spirit in his word. Did I say that fast enough? So Peter, this is amazing, Peter was a sheep gone astray. 
He did not deserve to feed. He did not deserve to shepherd the flock of God's people. But God in his grace, God's grace is greater than all of his sin. And he showers it upon him. He's repentant. This God, Jesus, graciously forgives and calls him to say, love me. Love me how? Obey this command. Communicate the word of God. Feed the people of God with the word of God. Look at the next gracious call, verse 17. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved, wouldn't you be? Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus asked the same question. Peter overall gives the same response. And Jesus gives him the same gracious call to love him. Like he failed to do so before. To love him by proclaiming the word of God. And that's exactly what Peter did, right? We go to the book of Acts. One day we're going to go all the way through it in like four years. But anyways, we go to the book of Acts. And the first, what, eight, 11 chapters are Peter doing what? Loving God. How? By feeding the people of God. By shepherding the people of God like he doesn't deserve to. It's absolutely astounding. And what's so astounding is the same grace that is given to Peter here in this passage by Jesus is available to you and to me. That is good news. Let me say it this way. Does God want believers to feel the weight of their sin? Yes. That's why the Holy Spirit convicts us. And when he convicts us, we recognize our sin and we see the travesty we've committed. So God wants us to feel the weight of our sin. And that's found in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Next question. Does God want believers to continually repent, continually hate, confess, and turn away from their sin? Yes, Absolutely. That's why believers are called throughout the New Testament to confess and to, as Colossians 3 says, put off their sin. God wants us to feel the initial weight of conviction and he wants us to confess that and forsake that sin. But does God want us to wallow in our previous failure that we have already confessed, that we have already repented of and he's forgiven? Can we all say it together? We're going to say no, by the way. One, two, three. So weak. Come on, people. This is huge. I, just let me tell you, I am an expert. I'm an expert at something, and it's not good. I'm an expert at dwelling over my past failures. I'm an expert at looking at my past, looking at what I said yesterday and dwelling on it for four weeks. How could I say that? Looking at what I did 14 years ago. Something came to mind this week that was about 14 years ago. That's where that comes from. And it's just, ah, and I let that crush me. Even though I had confessed it, even though I had repented of it, even though God had forgiven me of it. God doesn't want us there. He doesn't leave Peter there. What does he do? He gives him a command not to wallow in his previous sin, but to love him through obedience. And what a call. I mean, if anyone's unworthy of filling the pulpit, it's Peter, right? It's Paul. It's me. It's you. But God in his amazing grace. We confess, we repent, he forgives, and he says, love me. Don't get stuck in how you failed to love me. So we see this tremendously gracious call for Peter, three of them. Now let's move on to the promise. This is a little different. Look at verse 18. This is a gracious promise. Look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, 
when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you, carry you where you do not want to go. What's that talking about? That's talking about the way he should die. Verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he, Peter, was to glorify God. And history teaches us that he was crucified, that his hands were stretched out by someone else and he was carried by someone else where he did not want to go. He was crucified. Now, why do I call that a gracious promise of Jesus to Peter? This is why. Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. And before Jesus went to the cross, Peter claimed that and said, I'm going to do that, right? He said, I'm going to have that greater love. Greater love has no one than this. Greater love has no one than what I'm going to do for you, Jesus. Remember what he said. He said in Matthew 26, 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. I'm going to exercise that greater love for you, Jesus. And he completely fails. Absolutely fails. But Jesus comes to him and he gives him these opportunities to Move past the failure that's been forgiven and he'll love him by obeying him. And then he gives this gracious promise. It's gracious because, listen to this, there is no greater blessing or there is no greater joy for the believer than the opportunity to love Jesus. There is no greater blessing, there is no greater joy than the, for the believer, for them to have the opportunity and the power and strength in the Holy Spirit to love Jesus. And here Jesus is saying, Peter, it's not an if, it's not a maybe, it's not a matter of what your past looks like, I am going to give you all the strength and wisdom and opportunity to love me with your life. To give yourself for me. What an incredible problem. Do you remember when Peter and John, they go to the Sanhedrin, they're tried, they're beaten, and then they're eventually let go, and they're walking down the street, going back to the church, and what do they do? They say, happy day! They say, this is great, we got to suffer for the name of Jesus. What a tremendous blessing. We, in other words, we got to love Jesus in a manner similar to the way he loved us. This is huge. Peter doesn't, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. Peter did not deserve to die a martyr's death for Jesus. He was not worthy of a martyr's death for Jesus. In and of his own strength, he was a sinner. He was a failure through and through. He deserved to die a criminal's unpraised, ridiculed death and then spend eternity in hell. But Jesus, in his amazing grace, turned all that around for Peter. By grace, through faith, he's saved. And by grace, he's enabled through the Holy Spirit to love God. And it's not an if, it's a you're going, this is how you're going to love me. That's a gracious promise. That's a, I get to do this for you, Jesus, promise. That being said, think about this. Just like Jesus promised Peter that he would love Jesus, you and I have a similar promise. Very similar promise from Jesus. It says in Ephesians 2.10, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Wow, what's the good work? The good work that God begins in you and me starts with justification. Starts with us by the grace of the Holy Spirit, trusting in Jesus 
and his work being applied to our account and us being completely forgiven of our sin, completely justified. And then it moves from justification to sanctification, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. It moves to growing in our love for Jesus until one day our love for Jesus is maxed out and the work that God began in us is complete. In other words, God's on a love project. You and I are his love project. You and I, prior to Christ, could not love God. But after Christ, we're enabled by the Holy Spirit to love God. And today, as we walk through life, we do it imperfectly and we're growing. But one day, he promises us that he's going to finish the good work that he began in us. In other words, the love project that he starts in us, he's going to complete. One day... I am going to love Jesus perfectly. One day you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, are going to love him perfectly. Are you going to do it during this lifetime here on this earth and the body right now that you have? No. We're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ because of the Holy Spirit's work in us. And one day the project is going to be complete. And that happens when either we die and are absent from the body and are present with the Lord, or Jesus comes back. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is a tremendous act of grace. God, in his amazing love, gives every believer what they could not do beforehand, the ability to love him. And there's no greater blessing than loving God. And through our life, he enables us to love him all the more. And one day, he's going to finish the project. And forevermore, we will love him perfectly. What a God of amazing grace. Three applications as I close. One, praise God for his amazing grace. Like you, you and I, like Peter, don't deserve any of this. It's all by his grace and his mercy that he lavishes upon all who trust in him as his Lord and Savior. So we praise God for the work he's doing in us, the love, the love project that he continues to work in us despite our failure. Next application, as I said before, a believer stop wallowing in your past sin, confess, repent, trust in his grace, and lovingly obey. I don't give you that application lightly. That's something I really, really struggle with. That's hard. But it's good, and what's, what, it's what we need to do. And it's also what we need to allow others to do. As in, if a person sins against us and they confess and repent and trust in God's grace, then it's not our job to make sure they're still wallowing in the mire. It's to come alongside and say, let's love God together now. In spirit and in truth for his glory. Last application, unbeliever, get grace. Unbeliever, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ today, if you have not repented of all of your sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the God of grace in this passage is your enemy. You right now, as a result of not trusting in Jesus Christ, Romans tells us you're at enmity with God. But all of that can change, right? You can move from being an enemy of God to a child of God, from someone who can't produce love for God from someone to someone who can produce love for God. How? It is by repenting of all of your sin. Well, let's start with confession. What is confession? Confession means agreement. Confession means this. God, I agree with what your word says about sin, that it's heinous and horrible, and I've done it over and over again. That's what confession is. Repentance is when you say, okay, I agree with you, and I no longer want to live that way. And then belief is turning the other way and saying, God, I put all my trust and hope in your son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of my sin and the power to live this amazing life of loving you with all my heart, soul, and strength today. Today, if you're an unbeliever, you don't have any of that, but today... That all of that can change if by the grace of God you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray.
Dear God, it's so clear. We can, we, can, we can see ourselves in Peter's shoes every day with the various failures we commit. And we're just so thankful that you are a God who even when we're faithless, you remain faithful. We confess, we repent, we trust, you forgive, and you empower us to move forward in loving you with all our heart, soul, and mind. Dear God, you're absolutely good. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.